So I don't know if you guys experience this, but um, there's there's some things in life with me. I don't know what it is, but the, when that thing or that situation happens, I instantly turn into a different person. I instantly go from like this nice guy and I become a different type of person. And one of those things that happens in my life is when I lose my wallet. I literally become a different person. I get uh, just, you know, you ever been on the what if scenarios? Like what if this is happening? What if this is happening? Like all that stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So that happens to me when I lose my wallet. I become, I go nuts. I go bananas. You can ask my wife. It's really, really bad. And so the other day I lost my wallet um, and I had no idea where it was. And the entire day I was going through like this what if situation. Like, man, what if my wallet is stolen? What if someone's spending all my money right now? And then I just imagine like the person that has my wallet's on vacation, on a, like, on a trip to the Bahamas, on the beach, living it up at my expense. And I get in that what if situation and I go absolutely nuts. Anybody else, anyone in the back relate to me on that? Man, you just start thinking of the worst case scenarios. And so happened to me Monday, and I'm, like, freaking out. I'm texting Gabby. I'm like, Gabby, do you see my wallet anywhere? And she's like, and she actually doesn't answer me. And so I finally get home. I don't even say, hey, babe, how's it going? How's your day? Like, love you, missed you. I was like, babe, where's my wallet? Do you see my text? Do you know where my wallet is? And she was like, yeah. Uh, it was in the hammock the outside. And I was like, oh, yeah. For lunch, I ate outside, and then I was in the hammock chilling. It must have fell in that fall now. And all that stress, all that anxiety was worth nothing because I never actually lost it. I know you guys experienced this. Some of you tonight probably didn't know where your phone was, and you had anxiety, and it was in your pocket the entire time. We all go, and we all have these situations that are like that. And but for some of us, it could get really, really um, serious, though that our mental health isn't the best. And so we go and we live life and we struggle because we have this thing in this huge weight called anxiety. And this entire month, I want to talk about mental health because I know it's a really big epidemic and things that are serious going on in your life. And last week we talked about loneliness. And I know a lot of you guys might be feeling the weight of loneliness. And I hope I encouraged you last night. Guys, can you focus on just a little bit? I won't be long, I promise. We talked about loneliness last week. And I, I believe that you could get through loneliness and you get through the storm of loneliness if you find real, genuine, authentic community where people actually know the real you. And I believe that's possible that you can fight this storm of loneliness if you do that. But I want to talk about a serious thing and something that I know a lot of us here in this room struggle with, and it's anxiety. Because no matter if you're losing your wallet or finding out a loved one has cancer, or figuring out if your friends like you or not, we all suddenly find ourselves in the what if train quite often, and anxiety gets produced in our lives. And so I want to talk about this common struggle, but I'll just be honest, I don't have enough time to dissect all the complexities of this issue, because there's a, it's, it's really complex, but I still think it needs to be talked about, because I know a lot of you, to some degree, might be struggling with worry and anxiety tonight. It doesn't matter if you're a follower of Jesus or not, that you could still find this, and find the situations where it's really hard in life. Hey guys, real quick, just give me 10 more minutes, okay? Just 10 more minutes of silence and we'll be out of here. And I know anxiety comes for us in all, this, all different ways. And even for followers of Jesus, man, like <laughs> it doesn't matter. And it's crazy how much self-help literature we have. It's crazy how, much, how many strategies we have, but it still seems like such an epidemic. And recent studies from the CDC have shown 63% of young people are suffering from significant symptoms of anxiety or depression because of the pandemic. Nearly a quarter of respondents reported that they had started or increased abuses of substances like alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs to cope with their anxiety. It's crazy how people are coping with different things to try to fill and try to heal what's going on inside their minds and in their hearts. But the problem is alcohol, drugs, whatever you do to cope can't fix a spiritual problem. Alcohol can't numb the pain because something has to be dealt with 
emotionally and spiritually. And listen, I'm all for medicine and science, but man, you can't fix a spiritual problem with physical solutions. You need to instead let the healer, <laughs> great physician named Jesus, heal you from the inside out. And even followers of Jesus look to different things to cope with as well. Church might be a thing that people cope with. That they go and they try to come up with this emotional experience week after week to try to believe and to just try to get themselves over the anxiety. But they, but they don't find real good solutions to their storm that they're in. And so anxiety, it doesn't matter what boat you're in, comes for us all. And we have to have a better strategy to when the anxiety storm comes and strikes in our lives. But before we talk about strategy and what to do, I want to look at a story of one of the greatest heroes of the faith. And I want to show you that anxiety comes for us all, no matter who you are or how spiritual you may be. And I want to show the story to give us maybe some strategy after and maybe give some hope here tonight. So I normally don't do this. I don't like to read a lot of verses, but I'm going to, I just want to read the story from start to end. And I want to re read the entire story because one, it's, this is what it's meant to do. But, and I know this, that some of you have a horrible attention spans. We learned that some of you have eight attention span, eight seconds for attention spans. I think that's less if I did a study right now with you guys. But listen, I'm going to, I want to, all of us to pause. So I'm talking to your neighbors and I just want us to take a deep breath and breathe out. And I want to read this story and I want us to focus in on this moment. I just want to read the story of Moses real quick. You might already know this story, but I just want to read it again. So can we get verses up on the screens? Exodus chapter 3, we're going to be in. And it says this. One day, Moses was tending to his flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and the priest, Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't this burning bush burning up? I must go see it. And when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am, Moses replied. He says, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at it. And then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the impression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out in Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pesites, a bunch of others now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go. For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered and said this, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? What then should I tell them? God replied to Moses and said, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. <sighs> I love this story so much because I grew up in VBS in Sunday school like some of you. And I always thought the people who were elevated and we talked a lot about in Sunday school, that they didn't have any problems, that they didn't know what I was, was like to walk through my shoes and to understand that some of the struggles I had. But it's crazy how this man of God, this important figure in the Old Testament was struggling with anxiety. He was riddled with anxiety. Because of what God is asking him to do. And just imagine with me for a second this scenario, like this scenario right now. Like I know you might have heard this story growing up. But just imagine you just doing your own thing and you just see this bush on fire. Literally on fire but it's not burning up. 
Just imagine that for a second. Then as you get closer, the first thing you hear is your name. Then you hear who's speaking to you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God of history, faithfulness to his people. And God, he says, has heard the cries of his people. He's seen the suffering happen for far too long, and he wants you to lead the charge out of slavery. Imagine with me that, like, and this is, this is a people who have been slaves for 400 years, and imagine not hearing from God for literally 400 years. And he's calling you, and he wants you to do something about his oppressed people. And so he calls Moses to the task of leading these people out of slavery. And we're, not, we're talking about the Egyptians here. I don't know if you've paid attention to history class, but they were a big deal. They were the most powerful empire of their time. It was pretty serious. So honestly, I'm going to, you know, cut some Moses some slack here. It makes sense that Moses was riddled with anxiety. But God, in the midst of his own anxiety, of him freaking out of what he has to do, is calling him to a greater life. And what is that life? Being a leader and leading the nation out of slavery, out of their storm. I want you to know this before I lose your attention right now, that God wants, is calling you out of the storms of your life right now. That he's calling you out to live a life not controlled by anxiety. He's calling you out of loneliness, discouragement, depression, and suicide. He's calling you to take a step out and live a life of courageous, bold, sacrificial love. That's what he's calling Moses to in this scenario. He's not calling him to more clout, more possessions, more validation. He's not calling him to a more comfortable life. He's not calling him to something that even feels that right. He's calling him to be a part of his plan and what God is doing in the world. That's what he did to Moses, and he's calling you to be a part of it as well. And I want to land here for a moment and talk about that maybe the problem with your anxiety and what you worry about it's because your anxiety is rooted in the fear of the future. Like, God, who am I going to marry? God, am I going to get this job or not? God, what, what, what school? God, am I going to make enough money? God, is, are we, is my family going to make it? My parents divorced. This is crazy. And you're fearing the future. You know, when you're constantly worried about you and your future, do you know what you're doing? You're making the center of your life around you and not what God wants to do for you. And so some of your anxiety tonight might be because you might be in control of your life and that you feel the need to write your own story instead of trusting God to write your story. And God's calling you to a life that might not be, always be comfortable. God is calling you to advance his mission, not your mission. And that might bring out questions and concerns, but that shouldn't produce anxiety. And so some of you might have fears and anxieties about the future and focus and you need to focus on God's narrative and not your own. You need to be okay with wherever and whatever God calls you to. You need to know that you need to give him the control of your life. And yet things might be cloudy, but when you have the confidence that you know who's really in control, that will give you clarity in the midst of anxiety. And so how do you know that God is going to get you, though? How do you, how do you know that God has you? My... Um, I, I love to think about the worst case scenarios. I love to go on the what if train. I have like a season pass or something on that train. And I love to just play the worst case scenario out all every single time. And so how do I know, how do you know that God's got this thing in control? God's got your life good. Well, it's the same response he gives to Moses that I want to give to you. He tells Moses, he says, look, I'm with you. And who am I? I am who I am. God first assures Moses that he would be with him, and he wasn't asking Moses to do the task on loan. Anxiety crumbles when we realize we are never alone. We learned this last week, right? That the, I ended off talking about loneliness. Is that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you put your trust and you're walking and trying to have a relationship with Jesus, the first thing that God does is enters your, his spirit into you. And so he's never going to forsake you. He's never going to leave you out to dry. And so some, I feel like, like that's so important to grasp and not just know intellectually because you've grown up hearing that, but actually live and believe it. But there's this one phrase, and I love this phrase so much. He says, I am who I am. God says, hey, when, when, when the people ask, hey, who is sending you? Just tell them I am who I am. And I know maybe some of you are like, what the heck does that mean? This is what Moses is, this is what God is saying to Moses. What God tells Moses that he is, I am, 
He's saying that the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency, self-existence, and immediate presence. God's existence is not contingent upon anyone else. His plans are not contingent upon any circumstances. He promises that he will be what he will be. That is, he will be an eternally consistent God. He stands ever-present and unchangeable, completely sufficient in himself to do what he wills to do and to accomplish what he wills to accomplish. Knowing God's authority, write this down if you're taking notes. Knowing God's authority crushes our anxieties. Knowing God's in control should have this weight and crush our anxieties. I feel like I need to remind some of you how big God is in your life. That God has been, been a really good, doing a really good job of being God. <laughs> He's got that good resume and he, you know you can trust him. And I don't care what's on the news. I don't care if this world seems chaotic. I don't care that we might be on the brink of World War III and gas prices are going up. I know my God, and my God is who he is, and I could trust him because he's in control and he's got the authority in this world. Jesus said himself, he said right before he left, he says, all authority has been given unto me. And so when I realize the authority that Jesus has in my life, and I remind my soul of that, and I remind my fears of that, that loses anxiety. So when anxiety attacks, I'm going to attack right back. I'm going to remind my anxiety that fear has no ground. I've seen my God work. He's working throughout history, and I know he's in control. He's in charge. And when we realize that story, his story, the history, when we realize that story, that can help us get a good strategy on how to fight anxiety. And and listen, honestly, like, for those that don't care and not following Jesus and just here to hang out and you struggle with anxiety, like, I don't know what story you believe in, but, man, there's no other good story out there. <laughs> like, what are you going to believe? You're going to trust yourself? You're really going to make sure that you and what you think is right is going to make sure your life is good and you'll have no problems and life will be great? Yeah. No. We got a God who's been doing this a long time and he controls history. And he's writing history, and he can write your story if you allow him to. And so if this story helps our strategy, what is a good strategy then as we land? I want to just go over um, one of my favorite passages of Scripture when it comes to anxiety. So it's going to be Philippians 4. It's going to be on the screen. You probably heard me break this down before if you've heard me talk about anxiety. Uh, but it's going to be on the screen. And I just want to leave it on the screen for a little bit. And I want to break this down as we land on the plane. Can I, Brooke, Brooke, can you come up and play with me? For me, thank you. Um, Philippians 4, it says this. It says, don't worry. Paul's writing to a bunch of Christians, a bunch of people following Jesus. And they probably had a bunch of anxiety in their lives like we all do. And he literally just says it straight up. He says, don't worry about anything. This is the NLT version. ESV says, don't be anxious about anything. <laughs> and it's like, okay, Paul, of course you're going to say that because you're Mr. Guy who's planting a million churches. You're Mr. Um, great Christian. How, of course, I'm going to be worried about the things of my life. But he says this. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Okay, Paul, so you're telling me that I got to pray about everything. <laughs> Of course you're going to tell me that. You're, you're a Jesus freak. You're, that's what you're going to say. That's what you do. You pray about everything. I knew you were going to give me that answer. But I just want to let you know, like, how's your strategy going? How's your, how's your coping mechanisms working? Drugs aren't going to heal your anxiety. Alcohol is not. Pornography is not. Whatever you go to to cope because you're trying to numb out, you're trying to escape, it's not going to work for you. And so maybe try a new strategy. Maybe try to actually pray, have that conversation with God and let him in on what's going on. Because he says this. He says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. I mean, when you produce, when you, and I, I, know, I know what it's like to be in that what if train. It's like the opposite of being grateful. It's like the opposite of being thankful. You're not thankful when you're on that what if train because you're just thinking the worst case scenarios. But Paul's like, hey, be grateful for what you do have. And you're like, I don't, I don't have anything to be grateful for. There's a million things you could be grateful for. And tell God that. Thank him for all that he's done. And tell him what you need, what you really need. Some of you just go to God and you just, you're fake with God. You don't talk about the emotions you're going through. You're not, you don't like to talk about it. You don't want to open it up. You try to suppress your emotions. But God wants you to talk to him and be honest. 
Paul goes on and says this. He says, <laughs> Paul goes on and he says this. He says, then, <laughs> when you let God in and what's going on, when you actually are thankful, when you start producing some gratitude in your heart, he says, then you'll experience God's peace, which will exceed anything you can understand. <laughs> and his peace will guard your hearts and minds, listen to this, as you live in Christ Jesus. As you live in Christ Jesus. Let's keep going. Keep, keep in mind that. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. Remember that. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. He's saying, as you live in Christ Jesus, fix your thoughts on what's good. And so some of you have to, when you get on that what-if train, you have to get off and you have to fix your thoughts. And the thing is, we just tr try to like conjure up peace and we try to go to God sometimes. Some of us were followers of Jesus and like, man, prayer doesn't work. Because the problem is you're going to God like a doctor instead of going to God like a father. Someone that you go to, run to and just say, hey, hey, I need you. And when you live in Christ Jesus, it's this picture of walking with him, holding his hand as you're like a little kid needing your daddy to start walking. You just walk with him. As you live in Christ Jesus and you continually fix your thoughts. So when thoughts go crazy, your job is to start fixing your thoughts. Take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ because of why. Let's keep reading. Next verse says this. And you got to keep putting it into practice. It's about practice. You got to keep putting it into practice. God's, God, God's not going to just give you peace and then that's it. And you cure and then you walk away because he wants you, one, to walk through life with him. And so he wants you to walk with him. And you got to have to keep putting that thought patterns into practice because my mind is so jacked up. I don't know about your mind, but my mind is pretty jacked up. And I think of the worst case scenarios and I have to keep fixing my thoughts and I have to keep walking in step by the spirit. He says that in another letter. And I just got to keep putting it into practice. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, and because he says this, the God of peace will be with you. You want genuine peace for your anxiety? Start living with Christ Jesus. Start walking with him. When that sound starts playing in your mind and it goes crazy and it produces anxiety in your life, what do you do? You get off that whatever sound train that is, and you start producing thanksgiving, you start letting God exactly know what you need. And you start living and walking with him, putting that into practice. And then the peace of God will be with you. So I got one final, I got one final point. I got one final point. It's this. When you realize when the anxiety storm comes, and when the storm of anxiety attacks, pray to the author of history. And so I, I wanted to remind you who's in control of your life. I wanted to remind you how good God is. And so when you're like Moses and you go on that what if train, remind yourself of who God is and his character and his traits and his resume. And just start talking to him. Start praying. Because a lot of times I don't even do that. I don't even do that. So I want you to pray to the one who's in control of your situation and story. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, 